This video is brought to you by Practical Music Theory for the Rock Guitarist, my new book which is a comprehensive guide to all aspects of music theory necessary for playing rock guitar. From blues to the cycle of fifths, from understanding and using modes to choosing the right notes for a melodic solo, from pentatonic scales to chord construction and keys, it's all covered in a clear and concise manner. With accompanying video demonstrations, jam tracks and tabs, you learn to use the knowledge you gain in accessible ways that make sense for less than the cost of a few guitar lessons. Check out the link in the description for more details. Hello chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. Now then, um, there are certain types of musician, guitarist, whatever, who are happy to just pick up their instrument play have fun it's an entertaining distraction it's an engaging pastime and it's a load of fun and that's as far as they want to kind of think about it and there's a strong case to be made for that but i've always been a little bit more inquisitive um when i was a kid if i got a bike for christmas for example by the time new year came around it had been in bits at least a couple of times because i wanted to find out how the gears worked can i make the brakes any better that sort of thing and so i've always been keen on understanding the how and the why of pretty much anything i do and that goes with music as well and um there is one chap who has uh done several tv shows uh, on the intricacies and development and history of music um that he goes into some quite deep dive territory when it comes to music theory but always manages to present it in a way which is accessible even to non-musicians a couple of times when i've been watching his shows my missus has said to me she's he's interested in this fella isn't he uh, i am of course referring to the wonderful howard goodall <clears throat> Um, you know, if you haven't checked out any of his stuff, there's loads of it on YouTube. I'll link to a couple in the description. Um, but he's done, as I say, various TV shows about, um, you know, the development and history of music. And I thought what I'd do today is just share with you uh, what I've learned from some of his wonderful output. Um, let's start with the most basic form of music of, of all. Just a basic melody that could have been somebody uh, singing, you know, around the fire in the in the Neolithic cave or, you know, playing some sort of rudimentary animal bone flute or something like that. Coming up with a melody, here's me playing such a thing on uh, on guitar. <laughs> So whilst that is, you know, kind of entertaining, I suppose, in, in some small way, it becomes a little bit more um, engaging if we can accompany that melody with something. It also helps to involve maybe someone else. Music then becomes a communal activity. And the simplest form of accompaniment that you can uh, generate is a single note underpinning that melody. It gives you some kind of reference point that you hear the melody in relation to. We call this a drone. And if I add a single note drone underneath that melody that you've just heard there, we can get something that sounds like this. <laughs> Now, believe it or not, in medieval times, there were actually instruments produced which were whose sole um, role was to play that one-note drone. Uh, instruments like this one here, the hurdy-gurdy. You turn the handle and it moves a kind of um, circular bow that, uh, that causes a string to vibrate on a single note. And, um, you know, then you... Uh, play your flute or your fiddle or whatever or you, or you sing over the top of it as i say it mean it means now that uh, music is something that more than one person is involved in it's a communal thing it brings people together that said though it does kind of get a little bit limiting if you've only got one single note going on underneath uh, your melody but by the way we still have uh, drone instruments today there's one there uh, that single note low note that you hear on any uh, bagpipe tune that's your drone and then the melody is played over the top on the what's it called the chanter pipe anyway um nevertheless there were there was curiosity about how we could make the drone more interesting maybe move it around a little bit maybe move it around so it kind of shadows the main melody 
and perhaps that could sound a bit like this. Which adds a little something to it, I suppose. Um, that style of movable drone there, I believe, um, and um, please correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. All of the any mistakes I make in this video today are all mine, by the way. Um, you know, I'll, uh, <laughs> Howard knows his stuff. Um, I'm just kind of parroting what I've learned from his TV shows. But when you have um, that kind of uh, two lines moving in parallel like that, it's uh, I believe called organum. Uh, because when it's done with human voices, apparently it reminded the people of the of those days of something that sounded like an organ of some kind. Anyway, there were also moves to think. Well, okay, that that drone there, it was basically shadowing the melody in octave low. But do we have to do it in an octave? For instance, why don't we use one of the other intervals that was quite, um, you know, kind of popular at the time, the fourth? So if we take the first note of that melody like that and we count four notes down the uh, the string like that one two three four that means that this note is going to be paired up with this note like this and then we can move that around like that uh, and here's the whole melody uh, played with that um, drone a fourth below uh, all the melody notes Now, what was going on at the time? This was quite a significant development in, in music because at the time we only really had an eight note scale, not the 12 note scale that we have today. So remember how I was moving? There's my melody and I was moving the drone around the, the kind of lower line of notes, a, a fourth lower. I was going. Well, that introduces a new note is here because if I play the scale that uh, this melody is based on like that you can see that I've got this note here but the the, uh, the drone contained this note here so you know Like that. So why wouldn't they just use the note that's in the scale? Because it doesn't sound very good. Like that. So they, they kind of just raise that note up to solve that problem. And that introduced a new note into our eight note scale. So this is where we start getting sharps and flats and, and those kind of concepts coming in to music. So... What we've now got are two uh, musical lines moving in parallel. We've, we've kind of started off with a single drone, then we had a movable drone, and now the drone is, you know, kind of a, at a different, uh, plotting out different notes, not just the same notes an octave lower. What about if we added a third part, though, that wasn't really kind of shadowing the melody, it was just doing something of its own? Well, that's when things start getting really interesting. A little bit like this. And of course, we've got three notes happening simultaneously um, throughout that. And uh, we have the lower drone. I went back to the octave drone on that and then the main melody. And um, then, you know, the, the, that sort of independent part. And at the, the places where if you freeze frame that, you're getting three notes happening. A chord. This is where chords started uh, happening. Um, the, uh, the 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 song, the old English folk song, uh, "A Summer Is It Coming In," I believe it's called, was I think the first recorded example of this. There are manuscripts of that piece of music uh, dating back to I believe the twelfth or thirteenth century. That um, you know, this is where we, we where we started hearing chords for the first time. But chords weren't really a thing until a little bit later on because. 
that the mindset was, well, okay, we started off with a single melody, then we had a drone, and then we moved the drone around a bit, and then we can kind of have another drone kind of moving... Um, you know a fourth below and then maybe another another part just doing its own kind of thing but even that even that musical kind of uh contour there was still taking that da 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 kind of melody well it doesn't have to do that does it we can do something else in a higher register possibly just kind of doing its own thing not really shadowing the contours of the original melody in any way and that might sound like this And things got um, even more complicated. Sometimes you'd have, you know, like we had four parts kind of moving independently there. Uh, you know, it wasn't unusual to have, you know, six or seven, you know, all kind of different uh, tunes, all weaving in and out of each other. And, you know, the complexity of it became something to behold. This is, um, ended up being a style of music that is referred to as Baroque music, um, you know, Vivaldi J.S. Bach, all of those guys. And what happens in music when things start getting a little bit too complex? When musicians and composers start getting a little bit too show-offy, if you know what I mean, there's a backlash uh, in the same way as... Um, you know, Nirvana and Pearl Jam were a backlash against the excesses of the spandex-clad, poodle-permed 80s kind of glam metal scene. Uh, and in the same way as, you know, The Clash and the Sex Pistols and The Damned were, you know, a, a, a kind of a backlash against, you know, Rick Wakeman and, you know, King Crimson and Gong and, and, and all the kind of... Um, you know, navel gazing prog rock bands of the seventies. Well, the same thing was ha was true uh, years ago. So it was like we've already had the concept of chords. Remember from earlier on where we started having th three uh, melodic parts moving around. Well, why don't we just go back to our original tune and just stick blocks of chords underneath it? It makes the tune more memorable. It makes it easier to hear, and it just sounds simpler and you know it was a in the same way as um you know uh, should i stay or should i go by the clash was a backlash against um you know tales from topographic oceans this uh, movement became um the backlash against the baroque scene and uh, it could sound a bit like this <laughs> And because these clean uh, lines of just simple geometry and nothing too complicated, um, you know, were the, in vogue now, it, it reminded people of um, the, the sort of Greco-Roman architecture, simple columns and arches rather than, you know, all of the curlicues and gargoyles that were associated with Baroque architecture, which is why Baroque music was called that. So all of these simple kind of clean lines in, in music uh, brought to mind what was thought of as classical architecture, Greek and Roman, hence why that style of music became known as classical music. And, you know, it introduced the idea of the chord progression and uh which you know is the the underpinning of pretty much everything we play today certainly as as guitar players that's where we start uh we start with uh, learning to play a chord and then stringing another one on at the end of it and then another one and another one and we think in terms of the chord progression being the the engine room of the song it wasn't always that way but this is how essentially we've got here so there you go that is a little bit of a summary of what i've learned from let's have a look at him again the wonderful mr howard goodall as i say i'll link to a couple of his um his kind of fascinating documentaries uh down in the description and i urge you uh to go and check them out if what i've been talking about today has whetted your appetite uh, at all as i say any errors 
or kind of um, terms that I've misused in this video. Those are entirely my fault. Uh, don't go blaming Howard for those. But that is the video for today, folks. Um, hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you haven't already done so. And why not drop me a like as well while you're at it. Don't forget the live stream every Friday, 5pm UK time. We drink beer and talk about stuff, music, guitars, whatever. Possibly even this week, musical history. But it's a great way to kick off the weekend and I'd love to see you there if you can make it but for now i'll bid you all a good day and say thank you so much for watching thank you for your time look after yourselves folks stay well stay safe and above all stay sane bye for now mm -hmm.